Hi everyone. So welcome to the class. In the last lecture, we were talking about B2B strategy, right? So what strategies uh, are used for resource allocation? And we discussed about the BCG matrix. So a matrix which is a very, very popular matrix and used uh, across all companies and taught in almost all B schools around the world, right? So this matrix talks about two things. One is the you know, relative market share and the market growth rate, right? And it's basically a two cross two matrix where you have four quadrants like the uh, question mark, star, cash cow and dog, right? And a company uh, tries to you know, invest or stay in the business or uh, phase out of the business, remove its money by selling it off or you know, doing you know, uh, whatever strategies they want to take depending on what is the condition of the that particular product or service what it is talking about. So uh, basically this BCG matrix was a matrix which talks about largely a product, right? So the market growth rate of the particular category of product or service and what is the uh, strength or the you can say the market share of the company in comparison to its really, uh, closest competitor, okay? Only talking about a product uh, might not work, so sometimes we have to and to BCG being only two cross two matrix. Now today we'll be discussing about another matrix which was developed by the uh, by one of the most profound and profitable and very large and uh, respectable company in the world, which is General Electrics, right? So General Electrics uh, is one company which is a you know uh, the century's best company. It was declared. Now they gave a model which is called the. GE multi-factor portfolio matrix or in short it is called as GE matrix or GE 9 cell matrix, right? Now this matrix helps in evaluating the existing portfolio of the SBUs. Now the strategic business units, uh, it tries to uh, you know evaluate them and decides which business units to invest in and which one to sell off or divest, okay? So two factors what it uh, takes on the x axis and the y axis is the industry attractiveness and the competitive strength of the business, okay? Now how attractive is the industry and how what is the strength of the uh, uh, SBU, right? So on depending on these two factors either the company can invest or grow or selectively you know selectivity or use a earning strategy or completely harvest or divest strategy, right? So these three kind of strategies the company can uh, you know adopt. So either they can put in more money or they can be selective to stay or not to stay, they can decide or completely come out of the business. Now what is this invest or grow if I am saying if a business is operating in a moderate to highly attractive industry, right? While also having a moderate to highly competitive position, right? So it has a good strong position even moderate to high, right? So there is a massive growth potential. So the company can think of growing in the future, right? So in such a condition, it is better to invest. So that's what the strategy says. The second strategy is to select is selectivity earnings, okay? So SBUs that are either in a low or moderate competitive position. So what is the competitive position in the market? Either low or moderate. So it, it ranges between low and moderate, right? or in extremely highly competitive uh, position, right? In a uh, less attractive industry and uh, which is tricky to handle, right? So they are usually only invested in if there is any prospect of competencies in the managerial and corporate capabilities. Now what it means is basically, so this is, this may not be very attractive position, but if you already have developed skill, you have developed managerial capabilities, corporate uh, capabilities. so the company can think of continuing into that business for a certain period of time, okay? So, uh, <clears throat> but the third one is harvest or divest, which says SBUs with low competitive position in unattractive industries. Which, so, the industry is no more attractive, it is not a growing industry and the company, let us say, uh, also has, does not see much of future. So, in that case, it is better that the company should come out of it, so, right? So let us look at it more in depth, right? Now, when you talk about industry attractiveness, so how do you define industry attractiveness? Industry attractiveness, somebody is attractive, the industry is attractive. How do you understand that? 
So it talks about the perks the potential market holds for the company. So what kind of benefits this uh, industry holds for this particular company? So the company can understand the industry attractiveness or one can understand the industry attractiveness from uh, by looking at the size of the market. So how big is the size of the market? What is the growth rate of the market? Now, some of the factors like the political, economic, social climb, you know, and technological, uh, you know, uh, factors which we use in PESEL. And finally, the uh, Porter's, uh, you know, uh, five forces model, like what is the substitutes coming up in the market? What is the buyer uh, buying power, uh, you know, and the suppliers bargaining power, the, you know, the rivalry in the market. So all these different points, which is included in the Porter's uh, five force model, all this taken together with these factors, it, when you take to into uh, you know totality, then you can give a score to it and find out the industry attractiveness. So how attractive is the industry? Is it whether it is attractive or not? So you can find out from taking these points into account. On the other side, if you want to know the comp the other axis is the competitive strength, right? So in the competitive strength, if you want to measure the competitive strength of the SBU. Then how do we measure it? Not by taking the market share, the growth in the market share, the brand equity, the profit margins in comparison to the competitors, what is the distribution channel, how effective distribution channel we have. So looking at these points, the company can create a uh, you know, competitive strength. So one is industry strength, which is more macro in nature. And then you have competitive strength, which is more micro in nature. So like an internal analysis. Okay. And that is an external analysis. So, if you th think about a case, for example, let's say when you talk about you know the competitive strength of the business. So, what it is done is basically we identify the factors first. So, the factors, as we said, is market share, for example, you know uh, relative growth rate, okay, and then uh, the brand reputation and all. So, the company can what it can do is initially it can assign some weight. Now, that weight has to be decided by the experts, the managerial team. Okay? Now, for example, how much of weight would you like to assign? Now, let us say 30 percent weight to let us say market share. Okay? Let us say uh, growth rate is 20 percent, brand reputation is 20 percent and customer service is 30 percent. Okay? Now, after this, let us say there are five divisions, five different SBUs the company has. Let us say the company is into beverages, into soft, in some kind of uh, cosmetics, some kind of, uh, let us say, uh, some different, different products. Okay. Now, you can assign score in each point, right? You can assign score in terms of market size. Let us say, for example, we take the example of, um, as we said, G, uh, GE itself, right? So, GE is into healthcare, GE is into finance, GE is into, uh, you know, engineering, GE is into so many businesses, right? Sustainability. So, each business unit, how would you rate? Now, for example, let us say you give a in terms of score, in terms of market share, let us say G engineering gets a score of uh, in, in between 0 to uh, 10, it gets a score of 9, let us say, right. And uh, so, uh, so, the score is 1 to 9. So, let us say the rating is 1 to 9. So, 1 is the lowest, 9 is the highest. Let us assume this way. So, you may give a score of 9. Let us say for, uh, let us say healthcare, you may give a score of 6. So, depending on whatever the score, in fact, the market share it has got, so you give a score. Now, what is the weight assigned to that score? Now, uh, let us say what is the weight assigned? Now, 30 percent, let us say. So, what is total uh, value it gets? Now, 30 percent into, let us say, 9. So, that comes 2.7, okay. For similarly, let us say for the other points, which is like brand uh, reputation. Now, for brand reputation, you give in a 20 percent weight. Now, G engineering, let us say, gets a score of uh, 7 or 8. Now, if it is, let us say, uh, 7. So, it gets 20 percent into 7. So, 1.4. So, after doing all this exercise, you can add up this score. And let us say for, let us say, GE engineering gets a total score of, let us say, 8. G healthcare gets a score, total score of 6.5. G let us say finance gets a score of 7.5. So, accordingly, one can understand ki at what position they are in, what is the competitive you know, strength of each of this strategic business unit. Okay. So, similarly, the same can be done for 
understanding the industry attractiveness also. So, you can give a weightage and then you can give a score and then multiply and find the total score. After doing this, so you have the industry attractiveness score and you have the competitive uh, strength of the business unit. So, after having both the scores, one can you know place it in a like a graph uh, sheet. So, you can place the points, the coordinates and then see ki where exactly does your strategic business unit lie. So, let us say something lies let us say here okay, uh, or somebody lies let us say uh, here. Okay. So, the question is by looking at these points right this point this point or let us say this point let us say now what is the let us say this is x this is y this is z. Okay. So, what do we understand uh, look by looking at x now x is in a high industry attractiveness and a medium let us say medium uh, let us say competitive strength. So, should we invest yes we will invest because because at least the industry attractiveness is high and if we can improve our competitive strength, we can earn more revenue right? or more profitability. What happens if we have uh, in the case of Y? Now, in the case of Y, the industry attractiveness is high, but the company's business strength is low. right? So, if the company's business strength is low and not very low, that also it is not very low, it is very close to the you know medium. So, it is just close to the boundary. So, in such a condition it is it depends on the management team to decide whether they would selectively stay or they would come out of the business. It completely depends on the management. So, what is their core business, whether they what is their vision statement, what is their mission right, what is their objective accordingly would they like to stay in this business, they would like to come out of this business they can decide upon that. The third case again is a selectivity case where you see the industry attractiveness is moderate is medium. But the competitive strength is of the business is also medium. So, the company is a known name in this industry in this business and it is doing moderately. So, the company can now think of you know staying in the business or coming out. But if you look at another let us say x y z now we take one more. Now, let us say the company is placed here in this case and this is let us say a right. So, for a what would you do? Now, the strength is industry strength is medium. So, that means the industry is growing is moderately not very high not very low. But when you look at the competitive strength of the business it is on the lower side right. So, medium and lower if I give you even a, a score also you see let us say this is 9 this is 3 this is 1 this is 9 this is 3 this is 1 if I just do a very arbitrarily right if I do. So, what is the score I am getting for x let us say x y z and a. So, x gets a 9 into 3 27, y gets a 9 into almost 1 which is 9 right, z gets a score of 3 into 3 9 right, a gets a score of how much 3 into 1 which is 3. So, here also one can easily see that the score being the lowest there is no point of staying here right. So, the company can think of divesting ok. If you look at this model, this model is more elaborate more clear right in explaining because it does not tell you exactly what to do it is like you know it gives you a position the coordinates are very clearly explained and through these coordinates and by looking at the subjective factors the management can then decide whether to stay in the business or to allocate more resources or to come out of the business. Another important model that is very widely used after the gene uh, you know matrix model is the uh, McKenzie's 7S framework model. Now, now this is a uh, this this matrix was again this is uh, was a very popular is a very popular matrix. Now it was studied developed by McKenzie and company which which developed this model after reading you know uh, understanding lot of companies like IBM, Boeing, 3M, etc. So they found that there are two things that are very important. So there are 7 points 7 s it is said. So, 7 words which start with the letter s right, but that can be grouped into 2 categories. Now, what are the 2 categories Now, hard and soft categories. So, what is it saying let us see strategy is not the total answer to marketing success. So, if you have only strategy you might not be successful right. 
it is also the implementation that is important. So you have a strategy and you need to implement the strategy. So two things. So if you have a good strategy or a bad strategy, you are poor in implementing or good in implementing. It depends on what you are, where you are positioned. Okay. Strategy is only one of the seven factors that allow organization to achieve its objective. So it says strategy is only one. So there are many more which are there. Now what are they? Let's see. So, if you look at the 7S framework, now it says uh, strategy, skill, you know, style, staff, system, structure and the shared values, okay. So, let us look at each one of them. So, structure, if you look at structure, strategy and systems, these three, right, these three. So, these three come under the hard factors and the remaining factors will come under the soft factors, okay. So, what is structure? So, it is the way in which a company is organized. Right. So, what is the structure of the company? Now, uh, the hierarchy of the company, you know, the interdepartmental coordination, uh, the team dynamics, right? Whether it, uh, there is a centralization or decentralization policy in the company, and what kind of communication uh, facilities are uh, available in the company? What kind of communication, uh, you know, uh, uh, how communication happens within the company? So, these are the part which talk about the. Uh, you know, uh, the structure of the company. So, mostly we talk about a hierarchy largely, right. So, if you look at many companies, they are, uh, they have either a, you know, hierarchy which is, which is more flatter in nature nowadays, right. So, companies feel, so there should be less of a hierarchy, you know, more team involvement and power gap should be less. So, there should be very frequently discussion going on within the different members of the uh, team and all. So, all these things help uh, in the structure, which is one of the S of the 7S framework. The second is strategy. So, as it says, it is defined as a set of actions. Now, that a firm plans in response or anticipation of the changes to the environment. Now, suppose let us say there is an environmental change. So, customer uh, demand is changing, customer uh, trends are changing, maybe the government policies are changing. So, what kind of strategy would you uh, have for that? So, these actions allow a firm to improve the competitive positioning. So, first of all, it helps to clearly define and then have a, you know, a proper uh, uh, policy framed for uh, attaining the goals of the company. So, what is the competitive pressures, right, uh, changing consumer demands. So, and looking at the kind of what kind of, uh, you know, adaptability the company has to make. So, all these points uh, help to understand the strategic part of the 7S framework, okay. The third is the systems, which is another uh, tangible part or hard factor. Now, this refers to the daily procedures, workflow and decisions that make up the standard operations. Now, what does it mean? It means when you talk about systems, it says that, uh, for example, what kind of, uh, you know, uh, control mechanisms you have, how do you monitor your uh, policies well, right? So, is the internal policy uh, and the uh, objective of the company, right, Li aligned or streamlined uh, in one way. Otherwise, if there is, you know, the internal policies are different and the company's goals are different, so the, there might be a mismatch. So, what is the uh, system in, in place and how does the uh, company, uh, you know, handle this? Uh, so, this is very important in terms of the organizational systems, okay. So, a company as it says here you can see, so uh, it refers to the daily procedures, workflow and decisions that make up the standard operations within the organization and includes formal and informal procedures for measurement, reward and resource allocation. Now, what systems are in place? For example, who should be promoted? Uh, how should promotion be done? Who should be getting a bonus? Who should be getting a you know, employee stock option? So, how do you decide upon that? What is there any proper system in place? So, you see all organizations, be it any organization, a government, non-government, even a, you know any institution, people are satisfied or dissatisfied depending on sometimes the, what kind of uh, systems are in place, right. If the systems are well designed, then automatically it takes care of the people's problems. But otherwise, there is always a gap that comes in or a kind of a conflict that arises, okay. So, systems have to be very neatly designed. Then you have shared values. Now, these are the soft side which says these values define the firm's key belief and aspirations. Now, what is the key belief of the company? Now, is it are the key beliefs shared across the company properly? Let us say what Ratan Tata is thinking in Tata Sons or Tata 
is it known to the frontline worker who is working in the uh, shop floor or is he not aware of it right so what i mean here is when i am saying shared values the the company's value system should be clearly defined and that should be passed on to each member of the organization in respective of the hierarchy okay so core values what is the corporate culture now for example uh, you know it's very popular in tatas that tatas are a company which doesn't give a you know any uh, kind of relaxation to uh, unethical behavior right so that is a no uh, unethical behavior kind of a policy they have now if i suppose a new joinee doesn't understand it right he thinks it's okay to uh, you know make some kind of uh, adjustments so that that might not be taken well in tatas right because it's a very ethical company so what kind of shared values you have what is your corporate culture what is the values you are talking about are they properly defined are they properly passing it on to the next generation or the the every uh, member in the uh, system right then it talks about style so style refers to the attitude and approach of the key groups such as the ceo managers and other professionals the leadership style now for example a very interesting example is always uh, cited is about uh, azim prem ji so mr prem ji who is the head of wipro right at this time so he is uh, i think he has just stepped over so he used to uh, you know stand in queue for taking his uh, food right in wipro right now that gives a very clear message to the people that here everybody is all equal now these are small examples so rishi modi was one of the greatest uh, leaders the you know iconic leaders one can think of so he used to go to the he destroyed unionism in uh, tatas just by adopting a very small policy that he used to meet the members of the family members of the union leaders and speak to them you know sp spend some time with them now that created a rift in the you know among the union members thinking that some of the union leaders are in hand in glove with rishi modi so such kind of strategies have been very powerful on the other side you have members like jack welch of ge who was a complete kind of a very dictatorial leader so he had uh, you know he at his time lot of attrition happened but that was necessary for the growth similarly you have lee ayakoka of chrysler right there are you know akio morita of sony so great there are great leadership styles that is already you know always talked on in different management schools so how effective is are these leadership styles leadership styles right how cooperation and competition uh, you know uh, has to be explained and understood imbibed by the members of the you know company then you have staff now in another uh, s in the 7s is the staff it considers people as a pool of resources which need to be nurtured developed guarded and allocated and includes organizations human resources so it talks about the skill development of the people you know the number of employees you have there should not be like you know there is no work life balance there has to be a work life balance people have to be given enough uh, 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 you know time for their family also for their health also and so that they can be more productive in nature the gaps in required capabilities and capacities they have to be identified and proper training have to be given imparted to these members so that they uh, the staff are highly productive members okay so that is uh, the people side of uh, any company and that's a very very vital because no company can work without its people right the last point it talks about in the severus framework is the skill so it refers to the talent and capabilities of the organization staff so staff and skill are very highly uh, closely related so this determines the type of achievements and work the company can accomplish for example what is the employee skill or what is the employee skill that is required for a particular kind of job we may require some special skills do we have it so if we don't have are we going to impart training or are we going to hire people from outside so how is the skill management uh, being managed by the company so the skill of the company can become a competitive advantage for the company right so if you have people who have been working for a very long period of time and they have given you lot of uh, you know the time and energy so these uh, people have a in depth understanding about the company its processes its resources and everything so they can behave like entrepreneurs in themselves right although they are part they are the member of the company but still that entrepreneurial behavior comes into them 
So these kind of skills are very essential and every big company needs to highlight and try to develop such kind of skills. right? And if you talk about any company which is today a great company, let us say IBM, you talk about Dell, you talk about the Tata's, the Reliance, these companies have paid very high emphasis on each of this the 7S uh, framework, all these important points uh, which have been uh, you know uh, explained in the 7S framework, skills, staff, strategy, <coughs> systems, everything, right? shared values. So, if one of them also you are missing out, it can affect the company's uh, progress. So, this 7S framework is a very effective tool and it properly understood and uh, utilized with other, other management concepts. right? It can be extremely important and extremely helpful for the companies. right? So, uh, with this, uh, I will like to wind up today's lecture and uh, uh, I think uh, we will meet in the next class. Till then, take care and thank you very much.